welcome to the Don Fishing Gallery. This is a celebration, or originally we thought it was a farewell to the Curlew, and after having look at the, look at all this work last Monday when we put it up, I thought, no, this is not a farewell, this is a celebration. This is a wonderful old boat, which was built in 1922, I think, and she's now going out of commission. I heard about this early in the year and went to Penny and said, we can't let her go. We have to have a nice farewell speech to her. And it's pretty evident when you look at all the uh, works of the young uh, kids who travel on the school, uh, on, the, on the ferry, you go to school every day, um, organised by um, Nettie Lodge. She did a workshop here with all the kids. And also the, we opened the uh, invitation up to all the artists of the Pickwater to, um, to come and exhibit, which they've done. We also have a, a, a poem that is going to be read to us um, after the speeches by Nettie Lodge. We also have a new group, um, an a cappella group that was uh, formed um, by uh, Gordon Floyd. Um, I think it's called the Last Ferry Home. Is that correct? <laughs> now I've got a question. Do you all want to hear the a cappella group sing now, or would you rather wait? singer-songwriter came to these shores to pick water in 1972 <laughs> and was so taken with the curlew that he wrote a song <laughs> about it. But he did write a song about the fairy and we've adapted it for the curlew.
tradition of the Curlew. In olden times in foreign lands where ships and pirates groomed, a whispered legend came about and through the mist it loomed. It told of a secret waterway discovered by Mr. Pitt and a ferry that plied its coves and bars around its rugged spit. She carried her offshore passengers and their dogs who doubled as crew and the people of Pittwater loved her. They called her the mighty Curlew. She was a vessel that got them home across the treacherous moat and many a Scotland Islander was conceived in the back of that boat. <laughs> Lenny, auspiciously part of a fleet. The Wagstaff, Elvina and Curlew made three and they crisscrossed a regular beat. From Church Point to Bell and the Four Shores, around the island they went, through all kinds of weather at all times of day. Lenny drove it until he was spent. So he hired a teenage deckhand whose name was Laurie Duff. He gave him a hat and a box to stand on because Laurie wasn't tall enough <laughs> to reach the Curlew's steering wheel and other navigational knobs. And when people pointed and laughed at him, Laurie yelled back, Shut your gobs! <laughs> Laurie Duff worked day and night, which made his colleagues nervous because he scrimped and saved and by age 18 he bought that ferry service. The transaction was audacious and attracted competition from a navigator called Darrell Stewart, who concocted a proposition. He put his plan to George Bennett of Lovett Bay Boatshed fame, and together they bought a vessel called Grower, which put other boats to shame. It was strong and tough, and they painted it black with its three-cylinder th GM force, and with evil intent to steal passengers, they stalked the Curlew's course. <laughs> Pretty soon, the rival rivalry developed to a full-blown war with ferries charging everywhere in, a settle, in an effort to settle the score. Bugger the timetable, Laurie said, leaving earlier by the day, in an effort to thwart old Darrell and George who'd already cleaned up in the bay. As things hotted up, Laurie, t Laurie took the curlew off the street. He slipped her and tarted her up with paint till the ferry was looking a treat. On his way back from Beechels, he snickered with pride, but an ambush lay in wait. And the grower rammed as he neared Church Point. Laurie veered, but much too late. <laughs> the curlew's hull was scratched to hell as Laurie leapt on that mutinous craft. I'll teach you, you bastard, he spat and he fumed while pushing his way to the aft. <laughs> then he spied a cargo of vegetables and, and his anger drove him right to the brink. And he tossed every one of those organic boxes overboard into the drink. <laughs> Eventually, things settled down a bit and Laurie and Lenny resumed his post. The grower accepted she wasn't a match for Pitwater's rightful host. Who knows if they went away quietly, I doubt whether that was the case, for the ferry wars were notorious, stretching further than... Karingai Chase. <laughs> the legend of Pittwater slowly grew, as did its population, whose offspring eventually warranted their own ferry destination. Full of yelling, shouting, biting kids, the Curlew took them to school, and any deckhand who worked this run was either brave or simply a fool. <laughs> so Lenny skippered this rowdy mob alone with the engine firing until one day the youngsters caught him off guard by discovering the curlew's wiring. Down the back of the boat they tugged and pulled while Lenny had selective hearing and pretty soon the diligent buggers had dismantled the curlew's steering. <laughs> well, the shit hit the fan, it must be said, as Lenny Duck wrestled the boat, but he skillfully landed the kids on dry land while keeping the curlew afloat. After that, Carmel came on board to keep the delinquents in check, and none of them dared to rattle her chain as she took control of the deck. <laughs> as years went by, crew came and went, including one Mick Miller, who happened to skip her on a fateful day when he had charge of the tiller. It seems the curlew had sprung a leak and the water came flooding in. The bilge pump jerked and snapped in two, but Mick took it on the chin. As the waters crept up the passengers' calves and their shopping started to slosh, <laughs> Mick beached that baby on Scotland Island amid superlatives more than just gosh. <laughs> To the residents, it was a normal day, but the day, day trippers were disaffected 
So Mick re reassured them with made up place names and sent them away redirected. <laughs> Who could forget the massive storm on a Queen's birthday long weekend when a howling wind upended yachts that everyone tried to defend? It struck on the Friday at 4am while we were all still asleep. By 6 it had tossed all the tinnies at Carol's into a scrap metal heap. Well, Catsy was driving the curly that day. He came into Bell with a thump. Then he blew off course and tried six more times. On the seventh attempt, he yelled, jump! <laughs> we braced ourselves as the ferry came in and undignified, all did our best. <coughs> Through the wind and the rain, we landed aboard while the bin lid flew off to the west. <laughs> These are the days we remember most, the best of the Curlew days, and the languid hours spent to and fro in a mid-evening summer haze. The Curlew has seen us laugh and cry. She has heard our secrets as well. Like the fact that beat is beeping beep. I heard that between tennis and Bell. But the Curlew's tribute would not be complete without the people who've given her grace. Like Mr. George Engler, who informed Day Trippers that the island was an ASIO base. <laughs> Or Gentleman George with his bow tie and court, who caught her home each afternoon and offered each passenger a generous sip while singing a dulcet tune. So farewell to the Curlew and all who sailed her. Perhaps wooden boats have run out of luck, but her spirit and Lenny's are forever preserved in our youthful new ferry, El Duck. Now Penny and Simon will steer her forward while the legend of the Curlew thrives. But one thing's for certain in this place we call home, the fairies are all part of our lives. <laughs> Gospelly type of thing. Um, once more, we've turned it into a curly song just for the hell of it.
spent many, many thousands of hours in the wheelhouse of the old girl. It's good to see it again. Good to see a lot of people. It wasn't me. It's good to see a lot of people turn up here and show their respects to the old girl. It's good to see it. It's great. But she's got a lot of stories to tell. I've got a lot of stories to tell. But it is a good boat. Yeah, if somebody had money, one lot or whatever, it'd be a bloody beautiful boat. But uh, no, it's good to see it's good to see you all here with an interest in the in parish and I'll have a timber boats. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> Well, it's got, a, I believe it's still got a 6354 Perkins that was during the ferry war days. I had a four cylinder BMC and used to blow it up fairly regularly. The thrower had a three cylinder GM in it, which made it fairly fast. And as, a, as you know, it left five minutes before me and just sat in front of the ferry. And anyhow, there was wind in the ferry war. So after about three conversions of these four cylinder BMCs, I put a six cylinder Perkins in it. And we went out to sea one night just to run it in. And oh, no, somebody left the car the beer on board, so we had to drink that one out. <laughs> and on the way back in, the submarine service alongside us, so we, the empty stubbies were going to come back and put in the bin, which was you know, the right thing to do. But instead, they got hurled at the Conning Town submarine. <laughs> I just, I just hope it was one of ours, which I think it was. But, um, but she, she went to run the next day, and I was on board the Curlew, and I went over to Bell Wharf. And Darrell used to get in front, if he got in front of the 315 run, he, he picked up all the passengers. So I let him draw up alongside me, and he was stupid looking good on his face, he went to overtake me. I pulled the throttle back and made the level with him, he, he'd never seen this before in his life. Didn't know we put the six on the Perkins in it. <laughs> Anyhow, with, with that I just pulled the throttle back and just left him. The girl had made it, she took off. And that was the turn in the ferry wall. You know, the faster boat, so I got there first. But, no, she's a, you know, it's good to see, it. good to see people in, interested in it. But yeah, I didn't come in at all, so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's very, very good to see you all here, thanks very much. Tonight, you belong to me. <laughs> <laughs> 